Look, there's nothing more important during this time than increasing your skills as a software engineer. With the rise of artificial intelligence such as ChatGPT's ability to write code, it's become ever increasingly important to make yourself stand out as a 10x engineer. Today, we're going to discuss one of the major ways that it's highly overlooked that can turn you from being a novice engineer to a master engineer. People often believe that solving the given problem that your tech interviewer or the one that your manager gives you makes you a great engineer, but simply solving it doesn't make you any better than someone who learned just how to code. Rather, being able to write readable, reusable, and refactorable code will give you that slight edge over your competition. In other words, the big thing that interviewers and tech leads look for is your ability to write clean code. Let's start off with variables. The easiest thing that we should do is just to use meaningful variable names. For example, here this const yyymmdister doesn't really have a meaning to its name. So instead, what we should do is we should rename it to something that has more meaning. For example, let's just call it current date. Those who are reading our code will actually understand that this variable stores the current date of time. Next, we should be consistent with the name of our variables. For example, get user info, get client data, and get customer record all different in what way? We don't really know what the difference between user, client, and customer is, so why don't we just use user for all of them as long as they mean the same thing? Next, let's make sure that we're using searchable names. In general, we're always going to be reading more code than we will ever write, so it's important that the code that we do write is readable and searchable. In this example, what the heck is this huge number here? What is it used for? Instead, what we should do is we should create a constant for this huge number and then use that constant variable anywhere where we need it. Next, let's try to avoid mental mapping. So for example, in this code here, we have a list of cities or locations, and what we want to do is we want to loop through them with some variable L. Now let's suppose we did a bunch of code where we called a bunch of function, like do stuff, do other stuff, and then finally we did dispatch L. But what exactly does L mean again? Now we have to go all the way back up to our code or at the beginning of our loop and check what L means. Instead, right from the beginning, we should have just called L location, which gives us a really clear understanding and explicit meaning of the variable. So the lesson here is just to be explicit with your variable names rather than implicit. It might shorten your code, while being implicit, but it definitely doesn't help the readers understand your code. Next, don't add unneeded context. If your class or object name tells you something, don't repeat that in your variable name. For example, we can remove the prefix car out of all these variable names. Next, let's talk about functions. We typically want to have less than or equal to two function parameters. The reason being is because it's much easier to test our functions with. Any more than that, we have a combinatorial explosion and it's way harder to reason about our code. If you really need more than two arguments, what you could do is create a higher level object on the fly using JavaScript and then passing that as an argument. Next, we have the most important rule, and that rule is that functions should do one thing and one thing only. When functions do more than one thing, they are harder to compose, test, and reason about. When you can isolate a function to just one action, it could be refactored easily and your code will be much cleaner. If you take nothing else away from this video, other than this, you'll be ahead of many, many developers. Next, function names should say what they do. For example, this function called add to date, and then it takes in date and then month. What exactly does this function do? It's hard to tell from the function name what is being added to what. So instead, what we should do is we should call the function, for example, add month to date, which takes in a month, for example, January, and adds it to a date object. Next, make sure that you don't use flags as function parameters. Flags tell your user that this function does more than one thing. And remember, functions should not be doing more than one thing and only should be doing one thing only. Split out your functions as they are following different code paths based on a Boolean value. The next thing that we should do that follows the functional paradigm is just to avoid side effects in general. Typically, when we call a function, we want everything to be sealed up inside of there. For example, we have this variable name here, and when the function split into first and last name is called, we reference that global variable, which could break our code later on. Instead, what we should do is we should change that function to take in a parameter name and then return a completely separate name that has been split into the first and last name. This way, when we print the original name and the new name, the original name has been modified, and so in the rest of our code, we can continue using the original name knowing that it's still the original name. Continuing on with trying to avoid side effects, when we take in a parameter, we don't want to modify that so that when the function ends, that parameter has been modified. Instead, what we should do is we should take in that parameter cart 
and then create a copy of it, but with the addition of the new items that we want to add. Then return that new cart. A really simple idea that we should also follow is just that we should encapsulate conditionals. So for example, here we have a slightly complex conditional here, but instead what we could do is we can give that conditional a name called should show spinner, and that way if we put that in an if statement, it's much easier for readers to understand our code. On the topic of encapsulating, what we want to do is never to do any type of type checking. So if, for example, here we try to check if the vehicle is a bicycle or whether or not it's a car. And based on whether or not it's a bicycle or a car, we're going to do different things. Might seem pretty smart at first, but instead what we should do is we can write cleaner code by just using polymorphism. Another example of this would just be this function combine. Instead of doing type check of whether or not it's a number and a number or a string and a string, we can basically just add them. Next, let's talk about concurrency. Typically, when we're writing JavaScript and trying to fetch some data from an API, we're going to be using callbacks. But if we have too many if statements and too many callbacks, then what's going to happen is we might end up in callback hell. Instead, what we could do is we can just use the global built-in type, which is a promise. This way, we don't have a bunch of nested callbacks, our code reads more linearly, and in general, our code is cleaner. But despite this looking much more cleaner, let me fill you in on a little secret. And that secret is async awaits. These are much more cleaner and they work like magic. Here we have an async function that awaits the response from the API call. And then once we have that body, we can use that however way we want. But that's not it about concurrency. With concurrency and calling APIs, we might run into errors. But just like the code above, we can't just try that function and then console log the error. We need to actually handle it. So for example, we might console log the error, then we might actually notify all the users of the error and then report the error to the service. But of course, if you're still insistent on using promises, we have to do the exact same thing with try catches. We need to handle the errors properly. Now let's talk about a little bit of the nitpicky stuff. For example, let's talk about variables. For constants, we might want to keep them all capitalized or just use a regular camel case. In other variables, for example, function names, we might want to keep those consistent as well. Are we using camel case, snake case? Just make sure you're keeping it all consistent throughout your entire code base. Next, let's talk about comments. In general, only common things that have business logic complexity. So in other words, comments are an apology, not a requirement. If your code is already written really well, it mostly documents itself. For example, let's remove all those unnecessary comments, and the only comment we really need here is just convert to 32-bit integer. One thing that really annoys me is when people leave commented out code in the code base. Version controls such as git exist for a reason. Just leave the old code in the history. Lastly, don't have journal comments. Remember, use version control. There's no need for dead code, commented code, and especially journal comments. Use git logs to get the history. And that's pretty much it for this video. Not every principle here needs to be strictly followed and even fewer will be universally agreed upon. These are just guidelines and nothing more, but they are ones codified over many years of collective experience by the authors of clean code. And finally, if you enjoyed this video, like, comment, share, and subscribe.